when you walked into Toronto, I mean, were there things you had never seen before manifestation-wise or atmosphere-wise, something you'd never experienced before? Were you pretty familiar with what was happening? I was fairly familiar, but on a small scale. You know, when you have something happen in a prayer meeting uh -huh. with 15 people, and then you walk into a room where there's 5,000, it's there's a sensory overload. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was I, if I close my eyes, I could tell it was the same anointing. If I opened my eyes, what I was seeing was was over over overload, overwhelming. Did some of that stretch you, stretch your paradigm? It, it did, but I, I didn't have a problem with it. Okay. I mean, if I were to isolate this person, that person, this person, I'd say, yeah, I've seen that, uh, we've experienced that, I've had that. But when you have it all in the same room, it's just literally it was overload. And mm -hmm. but I but I knew it was the Lord, and I knew as I I was on a journey. I had already I'd already prayed. Uh, he had touched uh, me, touched us in 1987. So I was in Toronto in 95, February of 95. And, I, and on the way there, I said, Lord, if you'll touch me again, I'll never change the subject. I'll never, I'll never add what you're doing to what I'm doing. I'll mm -hmm. make what you're doing the only thing I do. And so uh, I went with that expectation. I didn't have anything dramatic, but I knew I had enough. Right. So I, I came home and, and did, did what I said I would do. So when it comes to stewarding <coughs> the presence of the Lord, it, would you say it's as basic as just walking with the Lord? I mean, would you say those are one and the same? Well, it, it, it is. Uh -huh. But when you talk about stewarding the presence, honoring the presence, I, I, think, I think it forces me anyway to be more intentional. Mm -hmm. More intentional, more, more aware of my responsibility, my assignment. Not gr to not grieve, to not quench, to uh, to follow his leading. I would hope the whole Christian life is filled with that. But when you talk about hosting the presence, you talk about giving place to the Spirit of God, stewarding presence. It it forces me to be much more intentional in how I think, what I do, the way I model that kind of a lifestyle. Uh, it's not just an add-on. It's it's the essence of why I'm alive. To walk with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. No, corporately in the corporate setting or to lead others into that. Does that change at all? I mean, what are the differences walking with the Lord personally and then leading a people <clears throat> or a corporate meeting, for instance, if the, d discerning what the Lord wants to do or however that plays out? Well, it's, it's an important combination, a personal life and a corporate life, because many people will learn to hear God, to sense his presence for the sake of the corporate meeting. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good place to learn. It's your personal life. It's when I have nothing to perform. I have nothing to do. I'm interested in who you are because of who you are. I want to recognize your presence because you're with me. And there's developing in my own walk with the Lord a relationship with the Holy Spirit that isn't so I can do something for him. It's just so that I can know him. Yes. Then I get into the corporate setting. I have history. I have a personal history that I'm bringing into the environment, and now I have to learn how to do it for the purpose of a company of people instead of just for myself. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is I have personal history with him that I'm bringing into the gathering. Yeah. Yeah. And that personal history is pretty difficult to give to somebody else, isn't it? And it you I mean, can't. You can't yeah. give it. You can model it. You can tell them your experience. You can, you know, stir up people to get hungry. And, things like that, you know, you can give opportunities. That's really what we do. I can't force anyone to have an encounter with God, but I can create the room for it to happen. I can uh, make sure that testimonies, examples, uh, scripture is, is put before people to stir up their passion, but, mm -hmm. but uh, you can't give away your history. That's, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's, that's yours and yours alone. Right. Yeah. There's probably some people watching who maybe have never heard anything like what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And um, when we talk about the presence of the Lord, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord himself. Yeah. Did you say that? In the Old Testament, when the word presence is used, mm -hmm. it's actually the word face. Wow. Right. So we're talking about the, the presence of God. Yeah, it's true, but it's his face. Amazing. Yeah. John the Baptist was sent out before the face of the Lord. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what we do is we, we usher in the face. The face represents the delight of a perfect father in a child. It's, yeah. it's the countenance issue, the face. And so that's what we do when we steward presence is we're stewarding the countenance. 
Wow. Yeah. Remember uh, Richard Wormbrand, I remember he said when he was taken prisoner by the communists all those years underground, and he, he had not seen him himself for, I think, 14 years. And uh, so one of the chief interrogators wanted to just harass him a little bit. One of the communists, they took him into a room, and the guy sat down, and he pulled out a Bible. It was Richard's Bible. He hadn't seen the Word of God in, you know, over a decade. And he said, I hadn't celebrated communion in over a decade. I, they drug you to forget Scripture, and to, literally. They drug you so that you forget all you know. And he said he would meditate on what he did know until he went into seeing and hearing what he was meditating on. And he said, so I've seen Abraham's camels and I've seen the masses that Jesus healed. He said, I've been there. Yeah. It's forever alive because it's his word and it never dies. Yeah. So they, when they took him, um, that interrogator took out the word and he said, is this book the word of God? He said, yes, sir, it is. And he said, uh, is your God good? He said, yes, sir, he's good. It's interesting for uh, someone who's been locked away to say, yes, he's yes. good. And he said, uh, is, does he make everything he makes, is it perfect? And he said, oh, yes, it's, it's perfect. And he whipped out a mirror, and he showed Richard himself. He goes, well, what do you think of this? All his hair had fallen out. He hadn't eaten well for all those years. His eyes were dark and baggy, and right. he had no teeth left. And he said, and his skin was hanging like a wet bag, and he said he had never seen anything like it. And at first it shocked him. He was just taken back by the sight of what he was looking at. And then the man said, so did your God create this? And instantly he said he heard the Holy Spirit. He said, sir, the Hebrew word for face is banim, and it's never used in the singular. He said, my God has many sides to his face. One is glorious, one is the suffering Christ, all at the same time. So he said, yes, the Lord did, did create this. He said, you're looking at the suffering Jesus in my face right now. <laughs> and the guy was just like, oh my God. Yeah. Who am oh I my talking goodness. to? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I never forgot that. Oh my Never goodness. forgot that story. Yeah, big time. <laughs>